Welcome back, friends, to the Alyosha Society. Right here, what do we do? Well, we pursue truth, feeding goodness through great literature. This is video number two of 12 on Northanger Abbey. Jane Austen. I mentioned in the last video that we're going to do a total of 12 and not one, not two, but three big fat videos just on the introductory material. We are really going to do this historical biographical approach thing right here. So let's get right to it. In this particular video, we're going to be focusing mostly on the life of Jane Austen, mostly on the life of Jane Austen. So let's get right to it. And slides coming up. And there we are. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm going to be reading a couple of times from a biography I read many, many years ago called The Parson's Daughter. Uh, I, I would recommend this to you. This is really helpful to me in understanding Jane Austen. Pretty simple read written by Irene Collins. So I just wanted to let you know that's uh, where I'm getting a lot of the, the stuff I'm going to be sharing with you. I want to begin, though, uh, with, with this question. You know, why Jane Austen? Well, you know, everybody, you know, she's popular. I mean, come on, right? Even if, if you've never seen the movies or read, people love Jane Austen. Why? She's a big deal. Let me, uh, let me share a couple of reasons of many that I think she's a big deal. First of all, she really is the first great female author in the English language. Now, that, that's a big deal. She, I mean, so in that regard, she's kind of like Ann Bradstreet in that she's a pioneer. Remember we said that uh, Ann Bradstreet is the first great female uh, poet in, in American history. So the, I, we would put Jane Austen in that category, first of all. Second of all, she is the queen of what I like to call comic irony. Comic irony. So she has her, her, her mess, the message to her novels, a lot of people don't even realize this because maybe they don't get Jane Austen, but there's a, there's a bite. There's a little bit of a bite to a lot of what she's talking about. A lot of people think of Jane Austen, they think, oh, romance novels and boys and girls falling in love and all kinds of cute things like that and puppies and so forth. No, no, no. That's not really what Jane Austen is. She has a bite. She is critiquing things. She's making fun of things. She's holding things up to, you know, at, to basically to a mirror to say, look at how ridiculous this or that is. She's the queen of what we call comic irony. Yeah, and that, that opening line of Pride and Prejudice is a perfect example. You know, surely, you know, every, uh, every wealthy available man is definitely in want of a woman. Yeah, whatever. Um, and here's the thing. She could write what you might call the perfect novel. We're going to go back to that story arc a little bit later. Remember we talked about the story arc in when we did Johnny Tremaine, well, if you did Johnny Tremaine, but we're going to be looking at like, what, what are the elements of a plot? Jane Austen was just brilliant at perfecting the structure of the novel. So those are just a few reasons. I think Jane Austen's a pretty big deal. What is it that kind of sets her uh, apart from other offers? Well, it's kind of rare that an author writes two masterpieces at all, but Austin did it before she was 22. Friends, that's just embarrassing. You know, I'm 52 right now, and yeah, I'm still kind of working on my first masterpiece. Haven't quite got it published yet. 22 years old. Sense and Sensibility, Pride and Prejudice, still to this day recognized as two of the great novels in the English language. She cranked them out before she was 22 years old. That's remarkable. That is absolutely remarkable. And then she cranked out this one by the time she was 23 years old. So Jane Austen, there's a reason. There's a reason that Jane Austen is a big deal. So let's talk about her life a little bit. And I'm going to show you a map here in a second of where this home would have been, the Steventon Parsonage, Parsonage, because her dad was a minister. In fact, there were a lot of ministers in Jane Austen's family. I think that's important to know. 
the Christian message that comes through in her novels is potent, I would say. So let's take a look at, uh, uh, glance over at the purple part first, if you would. You see over there the big picture map of England. Then I have a little square part, you know, of sort of the, if you look at England, kind of like a chicken kicking somebody or whatever image comes to your mind, you know, the big, the big long, the big long chicken leg down there at the bottom, then that's the big square. And notice where Hampshire is. So Jane Austen, this is where Jane Austen spent basically her entire life. She didn't really travel much at all. Right there in Southern England. So born in 1775, but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, something I do want to point out that I, I think is fascinating is the, the, her family. So here's uh, George and Cassandra, her parents. Now, if you notice, count from the left, because from the left would be the oldest children, and then going down to the youngest on the right. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. She was the seventh of eight children. Woo! Yeah, yeah, seventh of eight children. And uh, I wanted to read something from Parson's daughter here. Oh, actually, that's for later. Hold on. Sorry about that. Um, just, a, just a family tree in the book. But I, this, is, this is fascinating. The oldest brother named James and George, Edward, and Henry, three boys, Cassandra, her uh, sister, Cassandra, then Francis, and then only one child younger than Jane Charles. So that's going to come into play. You know, when you're, when you're reading her novel, knowing that she came from a family like that, some of the sibling rivalries and arguments that would have gone on in a home like that, yeah, you'll see those coming out in her novels. I think that's pretty neat to know. So the... Uh, Clergy members who, oops, sorry, friends, clergy members in her family. I do, that's what I was going to read for you. This, I think this is really important. Um, knowing that Jane Austen's family had this many clergy members in it tells us a lot about what she would have been hearing and experiencing growing up when you've got grandfathers and uncles and your own dad and so forth who are ministers, think about what kind of environment that creates. From the Parsons' daughter, I'm reading. Jane Austen had a great many clergy relatives. Her maternal grandfather and her great uncle had been clergymen. So were her godfather, one of her uncles, two of her brothers, and four of her cousins. Her sister became engaged to a clergyman, that would be Cassandra, of course, the only sister she had, and of the young men who were known or believed to have been Jane, uh, Jane suitors, three of them were clergy. She was acquainted with a great many other clergymen. They were thick on the ground in rural areas where the rest of the population was small. Uh, and a couple of sentences down, Jane's published correspondence alone mentions over 90 clergymen with whom she was acquainted. She was knowledgeable on all aspects of clergy life in these country parishes. That's important, especially the intricacies of patronage. The clergy who appear in her novels are an important source of information for historians of the church and of the late uh, 18th century and Regency uh, England. So I, it, that's really important, guys, that, uh, to know that she was just sort of immersed in this world. And, and if you've read any Jane Austen novels, you know there are clergymen in every novel, at least one. But what's fascinating to me is that they're not all the same. Have you noticed that? In the Jane Austen stories, sometimes the, the minister is intelligent, well-spoken, a gentleman, but in other stories, he's a buffoon. You know, he's kind of a, he's kind of uncultured and not really self-aware. Why, why do you think she would do that? Because she knew so many men who were in the ministry that she observed 
all different kinds. And so in her novels, she kind of brings out that variety. They're not just flat characters. They're not just sort of one size fits all. I like that. I like that a lot because you know what? That's reality. I know a lot of ministers myself. They're not all the same. They're not all the same, are they? Anyway, that's an important thing to know coming to uh, her novels. Jane's best friend. Yeah, there's no doubt about the fact that Jane's best friend was her own sister, Cassandra. Um, Irene Collins has a few things to say about Cassandra. They were, they were like this. They, they really were. It's really, uh, it's, it's kind of like my wife, you know, my wife's best friends are her sisters, her two sisters. That's exactly the way it was between Jane and Cassandra. Irene Collins says, Jane looked to Cassandra as a guide and a model. Remember, Cassandra was older than Jane. Jane was the next to the last in the family and the younger child was a boy. So she was an older sister. She was, she was kind of like a mentor to Jane. Does that ring a bell in any of her stories? You know of any stories where there's an older sister, younger sister, and the older sister's kind of a ah, sense and sensibility. Eleanor and Marianne. Right there, you have Cassandra and Jane. Cassandra was everything that she admired. Serene, friendly, kind, practical, intelligent, good. Yet Jane was never afraid to approach her with her own fears and failings. Cassandra was always ready to listen to her, to understand, and to enter into her younger sister's hopes and disappointments. Their affection for each other was extreme, their niece Anna recalled. It passed the common love of sisters. I think that's really sweet. I really do. I have five children, and my hope and my prayer is that they would be that tight, that they would have friendships like that. That's really important, once again, in understanding Jane's novels, because we see a lot of that. Uh, I'm, I'm going to pass over this just for the sake of time. Normally, when I teach Jane Austen courses and we read Jane Austen novels, I would talk a little bit about some of the authors. She liked Alexander Pope. She read Shakespeare. She read, you know, she was very well read, but uh, those are a couple of the authors that she liked. Uh, to read. But, you know, just as, a, as an aside here, that's a good thing to do. And I found that very helpful with a lot of my favorite authors and in understanding their novels better is to find out what were they reading? What interested them? Because that influence is going to come out in the novels they write. All right, let's look at the, uh, the order of, of all of her novels so we can kind of see where Northanger Abbey fits in. The, the first novel to be published, not written, but published, was Sense and Sensibility. Well, she did actually write Sense and Sensibility and Pride and Prejudice first. Sorry about that. But they're not published in the same order in which they were written. I'll explain that in a second. Uh, the second novel that she wrote was uh, Pride and Prejudice, published in 1813. Mansfield Park, published in 1814. Great novel. There are no bad Jane Austen novels. I'm just going to tell you that. She wrote six main novels, and of these six, the big six, as I call them, there's nothing bad. There's nothing bad here. They're all absolutely fantastic. Emma in 1815. Now, look at this. The novel we're reading was published, and there's a new vocabulary word that, uh, that I want you to know here, posthumous, or the adverb here, posthumously. Posthumously. What does that mean? Post, post, meaning after. Umus is a word from Latin that refers to dirt or ground. So I, I, I think the, uh, what this is referring to is after burial. That's kind of the etymology of the word after her burial. So posthumous, anything, anytime you see the word posthumous, it means it was done after the person died. So Northern Abbey was published posthumously in 1818. She died in 1817. But it was written in 1803. So it was written a lot earlier, just wasn't published until after she died. In fact, there were two novels that were published posthumously, both of them in 1818. And the, uh, the sixth one is Persuasion. And the BBC has done 
fantabulous movies on all of these. They really have. Read the book first, but the BBC uh, movies on all six of the Austin novels are extremely well done. I, I would recommend them. Okay, let's take a look at a timeline here. So she's born in 1775. Now think about that. Remember Southern England. What's going on in 1775? Well, the first shots are fired in the American Revolution. Remember that? April 19th, 1775. So that's what's going on across the ocean. But remember, Jane Austen wasn't in North America. Jane Austen was in Southern England. She stayed there her whole life. She never really traveled abroad. So that's what's going on in the world is, so she's growing up. So what's going on when she's uh, growing up? The French Revolution in the 17, late 1780s, 1790s. So when Austin is 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, right around there, the French Revolution is by far the most important thing that's going on in the world. Now, some authors tend to write about the big events that are going on around them. Austin did not really do that. She does, as far as I know, she does not reference the French Revolution or the American Revolution in her novels. She is focused almost exclusively on local life, the neighborhood. What is good about the neighborhood, the local parish, and just that, that you know, what's going on in the English countryside with everyday people. That's, that's what Jane Austen writes about. Begins her formal education in 83. 1795, she starts writing Eleanor and the Marianne. What? Bruce, that's not one of her novels. Yes, it is. It was the original title of Sense and Sensibility. Makes sense, right? Those of you who have read that novel, you knew exactly what it was because you know that those are the two main characters of the novel. Eleanor, the older sister, Marianne, the younger sister but that's actually Sense and Sensibility. She starts writing First Impressions in 1796. Bruce, what is going on? These are, th these are not titles. Okay, guys, that's Pride and Prejudice. Yeah, the original title of it was First Impressions. <laughs> Again, if you know the story, it kind of fits, doesn't it? Yeah, Mr. Darcy, Elizabeth. The family moves to Bath in 1801. And if you've read the Austen novels, you know, wait a second, that happens very frequently in her stories where a family moves to Bath or travels to Bath or they take a trip to Bath, whatever. Yeah, that's because that was a part of Jane Austen's world, part of her life when she was 26 years old, the family moved to Bath. Now, this is an important year. I want to highlight 1805 a little bit more. Her father dies in 1805. Now do the math. How old is she? Now she's too young to experience the death of a father. I can tell you that. She's 30. She's 30 years old and she was, as you can imagine, because she had a great relationship with her father, she was devastated. She didn't write for years. She was depressed. She took it very, very, very hard. And boy, I tell you what, coming from someone who's lost a dad, I can understand that. I can understand that. So that's important to her. So father-daughter relationships are important. And that's kind of going to come up in Northanger Abbey, okay, the, the father-daughter relationship. So, uh, but after uh, about a four-year hiatus, Austin then begins to write, the creative juices start to flow again, and she's cranking out one uh, novel after another. And then she died of Addison's disease in 1817, 1817. And hey, the day I'm actually making this video, we're only three days away from the anniversary of Jane Austen's passing, July the 18th. So, uh, 1775 to 1817, she, uh, you, you'll notice a lot of things here, but one thing you should notice, Jane Austen never got married, did she? She had some suitors, she had proposals, 
but she never did get married. And boy, look at the math. Look at the math. She dies at an incredibly young age. I'm way past that at this point. Yeah, 42 years old. That is, that is very young, very, very young to die. Boy, think of the work that Jane Austen could have cranked out if she would have lived to be 60 or 70. Yeah. Anyway, 1818, posthumously, Northanger Abbey and Persuasion are published. So there's the whole timeline. There's the big picture. Now, if she never got married, then who's this guy? Well, hmm, remember I said that she did have proposals. And this is really probably the most important one. Uh, let, me, um, let me read a little bit from Irene Collins' book. Jane Austen spent the next five uh, years of her life in Bath. The suspicion that her failure to marry had worried her parents and contributed to their decision to move from Stephen to may account for her strange behavior the following year. During the evening of the 2nd of December, 1802, when she was visiting her friend, Catherine Big, for the first time since moving to Bath, remember that was 1805, she received a proposal of marriage from Catherine's brother, Harris, and accepted it. Oh, wait a second. What? I thought you said she never got married. Hold on. He proposed, and she said yes. He was not in love with her, but it was his duty to marry, and as a shy young man, he turned confidently to Jane, who was six years older than him, and he had known her since childhood. His unmarried sister probably encouraged him to propose to her, and Jane had long been their friend and could be relied upon not to turn them out of the house when Harris uh, inherited his father's estate. So there are some practical concerns here. His manners and appearance were not prepossessing, and Jane had never been on terms of more than ordinary friendliness with him, but she knew him to be a respectable guy and to be reliable. As her niece afterwards remarked, a great many would have taken him without love. Remember, guys, in the early 19th century, women had a, a hard time finding security, financial security. So very often, uh, people got married. They didn't get married because they were in love. They got married because they needed someone to provide them with safety and security. It was a different world, friends, especially for women. On this one evening, he made the proposal. Jane believed that she would grow to like him enough to make the marriage tolerable. Hang on. The night brought about different counsel, however, and then the next morning she withdrew her promise. Oh, ouch, this dude could have actually married Jane Austen. But she, she withdrew her promise. Whatever welcome Harris's sisters had given in the match, Jane would probably have been regarded by the neighborhood as marrying above her station and as trapping the man who's much younger than herself. Now, friends, I wish I had time to talk about this a lot more. That is huge. If you understand what's going on here, that should tell you a lot about the character of Jane Austen. What happened here was she thought to herself, I'm six years older than this guy. I am not really going to be the best match for him. He can do better. I, he would be marrying below his class level and his station in life if he married me. So I'm going to withdraw my promise uh, and my opportunity to have security and marriage and so forth. And I'm going to do without because I think it's in his best interests. Yeah. That's the kind of person Jane Austen was. So she made the sacrifice and said no to him so that he could move on and find someone who at least in her mind, would be a better match. I can't think of anybody be a better match than Jane Austen. I mean, but hey, you know, who am I? She died in 1817, and if, uh, if you want to go to Winchester Cathedral, I've been there. i got a picture to prove it, and I'll show you here in a minute. That is where she is buried. It's a beautiful, beautiful cathedral. 
There's a picture of the inside, and then here's a picture of the outside. And then, look at that. Look at that. This is in Winchester. This is inside the cathedral where she's buried. And uh, look at that. Who is that handsome young devil? Yeah, that is yours truly. Uh, I had the privilege of going uh, to England a few years back. I'm going to go to England. I'm going to I'm going to learn as much as I can and see as much as I can connected to Jane Austen. I can tell you that much. That's where she's buried, right there. The the uh, marker. I'm going to read the the text on that here in a minute. And uh, there's even a little <laughs> there's even a little sort of a kiosk set up that you can kind of read about Jane Austen right there inside the cathedral. But what does it say? Well, it was written by her brother, and I think it's just absolutely beautiful. I really do. Written by her older brother, James. In memory of Jane Austen, the youngest daughter of the late Reverend George Austen, formerly rector of Steventon in this county, she departed this life on the 18th of July, 1817. For, I said 42 earlier. Sorry about that. She hadn't had her 42nd birthday yet. Aged 41. After a long illness, supported with the patience and the hopes of a Christian. Now look at what I've highlighted. The benevolence of her heart, the sweetness of her temperament, the extraordinary endowments of her mind obtained the regard of all who knew her and the warmest love of her intimate connections. Their grief is in proportion to their affection. They know their loss to be irreparable, but in their deepest affliction, they are consoled by a firm, though humble hope that her charity devotion, faith, and purity have rendered her soul acceptable in the sight of her Redeemer. Now, guys, that would be remarkable if it were written by anybody, a friend, a parent, but this is written by a sibling. You know what I'm saying? You can't hide your dirty laundry from your siblings. They know all of your warts and problems and ugliness, but yet, Knowing her as well or better than anybody, James still had these amazing things to say about his little sister. I think that's absolutely awesome. I don't know if the Bank of England ever followed through with this, but when I was over uh, in England, they were, uh, this was a few years back, so I don't know if they're still, they were still doing it. They were doing a commemorative banknote with Jane Austen's picture on it. Yeah, a, the 10 pound note. Remember, they use pounds in England, not dollars. And they were going to do the 10 pounder. That would probably be somewhere in the neighborhood of about 14 or $15. And um, again, I, uh, I'd love to get one of these if they ever made them, but uh, I assume that they did. I thought that was pretty cool. Why has she been so popular? Well, I've already talked about that. Her, her novels offer commentary on everyday normal life that is insightful, that is penetrating, that is relevant, that is interesting, and it's not confined to the early 19th century Southern England. Their relationships with siblings, friends, uh, folks who are engaged, folks who are married, aunts, uncles, and we all have to wrestle with those relationships. And how does our faith come into play in everyday life and conversation and relationships? That is why I love Jane Austen. And I think that's why she's still popular. You know, we watch her movies and we read her books because what she says is still relevant, true, and applicable in our world today. So, I want to also try to kill some of the stereotypes, some of the misconceptions of Jane Austen. First of all, that her, that her novels are just cheesy romances or chick flicks. Guys, they're just not. Uh, I don't know why they've developed that way. Maybe it's because she's a female author. Maybe it's because... Her, her novels frequently, in fact, they always have to do with a couple that comes together and, and they eventually get married and so forth. But 
get that out of your mind. That is, that is not really an accurate portrayal of Jane Austen. It's all about aristocratic society in the 19th century, and therefore it would have no bearing on our world today. Not true. But Bruce, I've seen the movies, the way people dress, the way people talk. That's not, okay, look, you got to get past the time-bound cultural issues and fashion and language. The actual relationships, friends, are things that still apply to us today. Trust me. These perceptions are not accurate. They're just not. And you're going to see that especially true with Northanger Abbey. Okay. Remember, I said I'm doing three videos of intro. So this is the second one. So we're going to do one more video of intro. I want to talk a little bit about uh, money and some other sort of cultural things. And when you're reading her novels, uh, you kind of get bogged down and it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense unless you know some things. And then we'll start in the fourth novel, getting right into the uh, opening chapter. So blessings, friends. See you.